But then what is it we're measuring? And standardized intelligence test usually measures, like I said before, variables that are related to academic performance. So we had Spearman, who did many things, but we'll focus here on Spearman's two-factor theory of intelligence. What we're going to see is there's a lot of intelligence theories, and you could, you could argue for it against various elements, and that's what scientists do. They try to find evidence to refute or support hypotheses, and as they refute or support them more clearly over time, they refine them. So one of our original, original theorists, being Spearman, said there's two types of intelligence. There's general intelligence, and then there's specific abilities that flow from that general intelligence. So if you think about it hierarchically, he was seeing that results on different subtests. So you have this intelligence score, but it's not just one test with one set of questions. It's made up of lots of different subtests, which then aggregate to make one score. And what he saw was if people did well on one, they tended to do well on others, right? Which would indicate higher levels of ability. If they tended to do poor on one, they tended to do more poorly on others, which would indicate lower levels of ability. So what he said is all these individual tests are specific applications of your general intellectual ability. Where he came up with the notion of G. G factor as your general intelligence factor. So if you see OG, it ain't original gangsta. It's original general intelligence construct as posited by Spearman. So that gives you a little bit of a mnemonic. If you were to see something like that on a test and you're like, what is that? G, G factor, general intelligence from which other abilities flow, not necessarily equally. So I could have a high, let's say, general intelligence and perform well on a lot of verbal subtests. Maybe uh, I could construct sentences or deconstruct sentences. I might be able to uh, show evidence of a, a very powerful vocabulary or understanding of passages or logical analysis, analogies, things of that nature, but not do so well on mathematics. So the idea would be that my specific ability in mathematics is differentially affected for some reason. It might have been something that was wrong in my own personal intelligence abilities, which we might consider a learning disability, something that could be compensated for if we could diagnose it, right, and give people appropriate interventions to help them bolster their relative weakness, right? Or it could be that maybe I had a bad mathematics teacher that gave me a really bad experience early on and I developed poor mathematical self-efficacy and I didn't think I was very good at it so I created a self-fulfilling prophecy. I just never engaged mathematics well enough to learn it. So there's a lot of reasons my specific abilities might vary but the idea that he's positing here is you have a general type of intelligence from which these sub-factors will flow. So reasoning is one of many sub-factors. He thought it was the most important factor because it enabled you to adapt to all kinds of environments and all kinds of situations. You were able to use your general intelligence, higher or lower abilities, to engage the world in multiple ways, depending on what the situations were. And as I said, if you did well on one subtest, you tended to do well on others. If you did poorly on one, you tended to do more poorly on others. So it must be that this general factor is the more important one. Now look at here how I'm Go and pass some stuff you don't need to study now for your test. I appreciate you coming. There's a lot of theories of intelligence, so I'm going to focus in on the ones you need to know for taking your test next week. Cattell and Horn proposed two types of intelligence. What you see with Spearman is two factors, a general factor and then sub-factors, hierarchical levels. Cattell and Horn proposing two types of intelligence that are are related, but a little bit different in this sense. Fluid intelligence would be abstract reasoning ability, general ability to use your working memory, and thus speed of information processing. Fluidity of information flow, if you will, in your own mind. Versus crystallized intelligence, which would be the specifics in your mind. Accumulated knowledge, accumulated vocabulary, accumulated skills, accumulated facts and trivia, right? There's just certain things you know that are fixed, 
right? You could now use those things to reason in different ways, but you have a set of fixed facts that are part of your intelligence. The larger that is, the more information you have at your disposal at any given moment. And then your ability to work with that in speed or flexibility or adaptivity would be your fluid intelligence. And my favorite example of this, and I don't know if it's too dated to use here, is Jeopardy. Most people know about the show Jeopardy. And Ken Jennings as the example. They took off the limit where it was a set before. You could only win so many times or so much money. You know how memory is. I'm not sure about that. But they took off the limit. Now you could win as many times as you could win. Probably never figuring anybody would go more than 5, 10, 15. And Ken Jennings came along and he won 74. 74 shows. Now his opponents were not dull-witted people. I've tried to do that online Jeopardy test. I flunk. <laughs> I don't do that very well. Timed questions and I'm going tip of the tongue. Oh, I think I can't. No. Oh, time's up. Right? And so it's interesting. To get on Jeopardy, you got to pass tests to even be considered. And then you got to go through additional selection before you're actually on. So the people who get on Jeopardy, generally speaking, have a pretty high level of crystallized intelligence. They got a lot of trivia up there in their heads, right? They're able to look at all these questions and they will know more than the average person would know because they have an accumulation of facts that seems to be greater than most people's. So they didn't have a bigger basis of facts than Ken Jennings. What I noticed Ken Jennings did was when the question got asked, he was quicker to respond. Whether he was right or he was wrong, he didn't delay. In other words, he probably had the same amount, roughly speaking, as most people of amounts of facts, but he could get to it faster than most people. Whether he knew the fact was correct or didn't know it was correct, he found out when he gave the answer and it was either right or wrong. But he could get to what he thought was the answer very quickly. So his fluid intelligence was extremely high. So if you watch the show, you'll notice that some people, myself included, if I was ever in that situation, would be like, uh, he didn't uh very long. He could click, this is what I think it is. He could access his own sets of facts very rapidly, which is what's required to do well in that, that test. I think he threw it, I think in the 75th episode, he's like, you know, I have a life and a family, and I have to go home. And he already amassed more than $2 million and became famous. But nobody else has matched it since. And I would say in that sense, it shows that his fluid intelligence were higher than most people's fluid intelligence. He had an ability. Again, doesn't make him a better human being. Doesn't make anybody a better or worse human being to have higher low levels of intelligence.